Welcome to another episode of the Victory Podcast, driven by Audi. I'm your host, Keely Yor, joined by my co-host and former USC defender, Dion Bailey. Dion, we are back for another show. Unfortunately, it is not a victory episode. We have to talk about USC's first loss of the season at Notre Dame. Uh, before we talk about football, Dion, I just want to congratulate you and your wonderful family. You are now a father of three. Your dedication has never been a question on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, once again, you have a child and still are able to podcast. Podcast, but just wanted to say congratulations to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. This family is uh, family five now and complete. There, That was my last contribution to the Bailey legacy. So <laughs> I hope everyone, uh, my mom and dad and in-laws, I hope they're, they're satisfied because uh, <laughs> the buck stops there. They, they better be. You got some cute kids, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. But like I said, Dion, we unfortunately have to talk about USC's 48-20 to 20 loss in Notre Dame, or at Notre Dame. The loss streak continues. USC still hasn't won in South Bend since 2011. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get to as well, Dion. So love to get your thoughts. Um, for once, it's really interesting talking about uh, USC's offense. I feel like usually we get a lot of questions about USC's defense, but we have a lot mm -hmm. of questions about USC's offense this week. So we'll get into that later in the episode. Uh, before we do, just want to drop a couple reminders. If you're enjoying this show whether you're watching it on youtube or on or listening to it on a podcasting platform please like and subscribe uh, it really helps grow the show we appreciate everyone who's done that so far and like i said we're simulcasting so if you want to see uh dion and i podcast live uh, you can go on the usc athletics youtube channel and that's where you can find us also we record on sundays and wednesdays so if you want ever want to get on the schedule that's what we do now i will say we are recording on a monday full disclosure <laughs> and honestly i don't have a good excuse besides the fact that I was exhausted. <laughs> uh, my, <laughs> my body clock right now is all over the place. I have no uh, sense of time anymore. I'm just, you know, when you get to a point where you're traveling and it's mid-season, you're just like, I'm here, I'm doing what I need to do, but I have no time, What I have no sense of time or energy. So that's why we're recording late. And uh, Dion, once again, was very nice and flexible to record on a Monday. So we're here and we're podcasting. Um, and if you ever want to get your voice heard, you can also uh, drop some questions. Like I mentioned, we have uh, questions to answer. You can go to Twitter or Instagram, VictoryPodUSC. We usually put out a tweet or a question box the day before we record. And that's how you can get your voice heard. Um, and then without further ado, just want to thank Audi. Performance is more exhilarating on a real road. Introduce the Audi Q5. Visit your SoCal Audi dealers, proud sponsors of the USC Trojans. And thanks to Ralph's, everyone wins when it comes to saving big because when you order online through the Ralph's app, you get the same great prices, deals, and rewards on pickup or delivery that you do in store. So no matter how you shop, you always say big at Ralph's. Ralph's, fresh for everyone, fight on. All righty, Dion, I got through all the uh, <laughs> reminders, all the things that we need to do. Great before job, we get... great job as always. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the show, and so just to start it off, Dion, I just want to get your thoughts. What what did you take away from USC's seventh game of the season, but first loss of the season? Um, it was just a disappointing, uh, just a disappointing uh, amount of unfor unfortunate events. Like I feel like yeah. it was kind of like an out of body experience for everybody that was watching it. It was just what well, we're not the complete opposite of what we're used to seeing and. Ironically, I mean, the, the the side of the ball that's been getting a lot of slack, a lot of flack, really the whole year played a, a pretty awesome game when you really look at the numbers and uh, just how the whole game unfolded, man. They really came ready to do their part, and it's just unfortunate that, uh, uh, you know, just players that generally make plays just didn't make those plays on the big stage, I mean, when everybody, you know, wished that they could have made them. But fortunately, it's an out-of-conference game. And uh, truthfully, all their, you know, aspirations and goals are still attainable. So, I mean, it's a tough loss because of the tradition of the rivalry and, and all of that and our uh, recent uh, lack of success, so to speak, in South Bend. So it was just disappointing not to uh, be able to get a W out there. But it's definitely not like uh, the, the, the sky is falling or uh, the world's over type moment at all. So it's a lot to still be uh, excited to look forward to. And, uh, I mean, the, the boys got a, a great opportunity to ride the ship this week against the Utes. 
And that's essentially what head coach Lincoln Riley said, Dion. He was talking about how, you know, we uh, put so much stake in this rivalry, rightfully so, as USC fans or uh, Notre Dame fans. But at the end of the day, it's an out-of-conference game. So uh, USC is still undefeated in the Pac-12. And and at, at this point, he made it sound like it's about how they respond. Like, adversity is going to happen, but it's how they respond. Um, as someone who's been in the locker room, Dion, what does that response look like? If you're a USC trying to turn the page this week for the youths, what are you doing to prepare and kind of make sure you get those corrections done? Really just take a hard hard look in the mirror and trying to, uh, you know, uh, study yourself, see what, what went wrong, how uh, each individual can improve. And really, I mean, it's, I, I, I guess you could say a humbling type experience when you're riding high and then you really just lay an egg, like not like, how you thought it would it would go, but the complete opposite. So it was really just leaves you at loss for words. Nobody could really understand, I'm sure, in that locker room, uh, really understand what happened and what they saw Saturday night. So it's just one that you got to – I know some some guys say, like, flush the tape and whatnot, especially if it's, if it's not something that's going to roll over to the next game. But uh, with that, who the opponent was and what that game means to the university, I really feel like they should – you know, just attack it and uh, really set the standard that what was displayed on Saturday, especially against that particular opponent, is not something that, you know, we want to see happen again. So hopefully they really just buckle down and uh, really get to the to the nuts and bolts of the tape and uh, really try and fix what what went wrong. Really, ironically, on the majority on the offensive side of the ball, which is so weird to, to say because I feel like that's – we haven't said that since the Oregon State game. So it's uh, unfortunate that this was this year's Oregon State game and it just happened to be against Notre Dame. So hopefully they could just bond together and move past that and understand that, like I said, I, I made a tweet about this, that there's no better opponent to come off like a shocking laying of an egg type game like that than an opponent that you lost to two times a year before. So it's a great uh they're in a great position to really turn the page. Like we'll really see what type of team we were rooting on this week because they have a great opportunity still ahead of them. And uh, we'll really see if they uh, really still believe that goal is attainable and uh, are doing the things they, that are necessary to uh, right the wrongs and get the train back on, on the right uh, track this week. So that's really, I mean, I feel like what the energy will be like in the locker room. I think we have a question that sums it up best, and it comes from Rama. He said, um, was this game just a one-off where we made too many mistakes to over overcome? And so I think that's the feeling from fans. It's like, is this a one-off where, you know, the defensive side, like you mentioned, was able to put it together? Apparently, according to PFF, Pro Football Focus, they only had two missed tackles, which was the lowest of any team in Week 7. Um, and so we haven't talked about it yet, but Caleb Williams with three interceptions, his worst game uh, by that metric in his college career. Um, usually, and, and you mentioned it, it's kind of weird to just talk about this because Caleb Williams is the one that we've always been able to rely on uh, if you're a USC fan and, and someone that you just know that that performance is going to be at a certain level every single game, and yet it wasn't. And it was uh, USC is not used to having to overcome Caleb Williams' mistakes. So in that sense, going back to Rama's question, is this a one-off from USC's offense from Caleb Williams, or is this uh, something that – was kind of showing throughout the season, but was finally shown against Notre Dame. Uh, I definitely am hoping that it's a one-off on like Caleb's, I, I guess you could say decision-making or him just feeling like he had to press. Like I tried to warn the feeling of playing at in South Bend at night. Like it feels like a big game. You feel like you want to, you know, put your best foot forward and you kind of press a little bit, especially if it's not going your way mm -hmm. in a particular moment. And I just feel like that's what happened to Caleb. You know, he's used to being Superman and he he's had he had opportunities to to make some plays and he just was a little bit off and, and he just was kind of feeling it, the, 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 uh, the pressure that, you know, if he's not on, I mean, who's going to do it type deal? Because it's not like he's a receiver or running back. He's the quarterback. So 
he's the uh the driver of the bus so I, I felt like he was just pressing and that's what led to his his second and third interception in my opinion his first mm-hmm. one was just just it was early on and he just was a little bit off at the beginning of the game and then how uh some the game unfolded we got behind so fast he he just started pressing and i feel like that led to other uh decisions and uh you know plays that he he made in the game that, he, that caleb just normally wouldn't make so i'm just hoping that was a, a one-off and uh you know next week the offense and uh is back you know clicking on all cylinders and caleb is back you know to doing the caleb things that he's been doing all year Offensive line coach Josh Henson, uh, we got to talk to him last week. He didn't seem too pleased. He said there's always things that, that the team can, or the, the offensive line in particular, can improve on. So he wanted to see more from his team. And unfortunately, it seemed like it wasn't the best day out there for USC's offensive line against Notre Dame. Is this something where, um, you know, it's, it's once again a one-off? Or have we seen the cracks at times and it's starting to show against more the, the tougher part of USC's schedule? I'm hoping that's a one-off as well because this was really tr- truthfully no slight to any team that we faced before Notre Dame. This is our first, like, big-time opponent that got, you know, like a ton of NFL guys across from, from like, especially on the D-line and in the, uh, in the second level at the linebacker level for our offensive line having to block this year. So we didn't – and they came with the the scheme of not doing the, the three-man rush and dropping – eight and uh or seven a only rushing four or three they decided to rush four minimum five sometimes six and really try and heat caleb up and that's the first time this year they really experienced that a lot of people have taken the path of dropping more defenders than you know trying to sack caleb this year and yeah. trying to confuse him that way so I feel like it's just a, a learning adjustment because now that they put that on tape, I mean, we got an opponent this week that kind of has a similar build on defense and they could try and attack us the same way. So it's going to be a great opportunity for them. Now that they got it on tape, they can coach it up, hopefully, and uh, go out there and be able to add a tool to their toolbox and, and have a plan for when guys decide to attack them with pressure or how people have played us previously in the season only rushing three, trying to drop eight, or rushing four, dropping seven, and bringing in an extra DB or sometimes two extra DBs. And I know I'm kind of putting you, putting you on the spot here, but if you had to compare similarities between Utah's defense and Notre Dame's defense, what do you see there? They're very similar, to be honest with you. Utah is built like a Notre Dame. You know, Notre Dame, they don't have – I don't want to say that because it's not a state – they put guys in the NFL and all that, but they don't have, like, elite outside talent. Like, they don't got blazers on the outside. Like, if you go, you see an Oregon or any true high-flying offense, they're electric at all the skill positions. They may not be the biggest, but they're super fast, super twitchy. And on the opposite side, they, their DBs are super fast, super twitchy linebackers. Maybe not be the biggest guys, but they can really run. And they're built more like a like a Big Ten team, to be honest with you, like an Ohio State or like a Michigan. Real solid big dudes at linebacker. They can move well, not like four four guys, you know, but big, great, uh, you know, movement, physical, and all the D line across the board are huge, big guys, move well. NFL caliber bodies, regard. I mean, regard. It's it's up to you to decide if it's NFL talent with that uh, f- physical uh, stature. But that um, that type of build, Utah brings that exact type of you know flair to their defense. They are big up front, big at linebacker. They can move. They they're not the most athletic guys, but they move well. They understand their defense to a T. Yeah. And uh, so it's a great, it was a great, I guess, you know, pregame leading into a conference game with a very similar opponent. So it could bear well for uh, for the Trojans this week. So in your opinion, what would turning the page look like against that defense? What would it, what would show that USC at least made an improvement from Notre Dame? Uh, just picking up the the five man pressure, six man pressure, five man specifically cuz when they bring six, I mean 
someone's going to, you only got five guys unless you keep a back end or you chip with a tight end. So more concerned about the five man pressure. They just bring that extra rusher, whether it's a linebacker or a DB off the edge or up the middle. Them, uh, all the O line and if the running backs in there, Caleb included all being on the same page on who's got who and, uh, what's the the who's the hot read and all the just the characteristics of a of an offense that's prepared to take on a blitzing defense so hopefully that's what we see this weekend because I, I honestly believe Utah is going to attack our offense the exact same way because like I said they're built the same way and they have the the bodies to emulate what Notre Dame put on tape on Saturday so mm. I definitely think uh we'll we'll see if they've we're able to turn the page and make the necessary adjustments to handle this type of scheme on defense. Something that was notable on Saturday was the fact that Zachariah Branch returned after a couple of absences from him. He did not play starting against Colorado. It You could just tell Dion, he is a difference maker. Not that we, mm. we question that at all, but what did you <laughs> see from having Zachariah back into USC's offense? He's explosive, man. He's a at any moment just a firecracker, just a a firework that can go off at any any moment. He has the ball in his hand, so I definitely was excited to see him take the field again. And um, he looked a, looked like himself, looked like he was confident in his ability, he wasn't you know hesitant or anything. So that was exciting to see because he missed you know, the previous couple of games. So. It was a, it was good to see him get out there and, and make a couple splash plays. I just, you know, me personally, I wish he was more of a focal point in the offense. Like, even if we had to take it back to the Kiff days and force the ball to him. Like, even yeah, if I was gonna ask you, was coming, force what it is to that, him. What does that actually look like when you're forcing it to him? Uh, I mean, just like when a team knows you're going to run the ball like Stanford used to do back in the day and they would still run it. 30, 40 times, like just a, hey, even though, you know, we, you know, what we're doing, you know, who's getting the ball. We think that we can still get it done. So I feel like they can put him in a lot of positions. They can put him in a lot of motion position, motion opportunities where they can identify if he's in a man or a zone, uh, the uh, defender that's guarding him and mm. game plan it that way because he's so fast, kind of like how Miami uses Tyreek Hill. Like he has that same, flair to his game so it's like you can only scheme it so much like I feel like they need to force that force people to show that they can stop him if he's the focal point because literally nobody's stopped him yet like once almost every time you get the ball it's an explosive play whether it's yeah. on special teams or at running back that we seen on Saturday or in the slot so I just feel like I know he's young and he may need to develop a little more physically I, i'm not sure i haven't really been up on him face to face to really size him up like that but he looks like he handles himself well and i um possibly if we up this his load on uh his amount of touches per game it could help you know take some of the pressure off of, of what maybe what caleb is feeling a little bit yeah it'll be interesting to see how they use him going forward considering it sounded like um Riley kept saying, like, we need to to judge it right, meaning, like, his whatever the injury was, we don't actually know, but uh, mm -hmm. it sounded like they wanted to be smart about it. So I wonder if the touches was also dictated by just the, the status of his health on Saturday. Um, but definitely something to watch for going forward. Um, now, we have a lot of questions about the offense. I don't know if, if you have any more thoughts, Dion, or if you want to head over to talk about the defense. Um, nah, I'll wait for the questions. I mean, <laughs> we all we all saw the unfortunate events and uh Yeah. So I'm sure whatever the, all the questions that come through they'll answer some of the hot, you know, points of what the people want to hear. Now over on defense, I thought it was interesting when they did finally bring out the defense after that first pick. Uh Rajon Davis got the start at inside linebacker, and that's something we've been talking about on our episodes, Dion. What did you make of uh the inside linebacker rotation now that we actually saw Rajon Davis get the field? Uh I mean it was it was good to see, you know, him being given an opportunity after what he's put on tape earlier in the season with his opportunities he's been given. So that was exciting to see in the defense. They uh they they look stout. I mean, in that that first uh first time they took the field, I mean, I believe they returned that interception to like 
within the 20 yard line. So it wasn't great field position for sure. Yeah. It wasn't much, you know, much, much grass to defend for the defense. So it was unfortunate in that aspect, but they looked stout. Didn't look like they, uh, didn't believe that they could stop the opposition. So that was exciting to see guys making plays, a lot of, uh, past deflections and things like that. So it was, it was exciting the energy that they were playing with, but, uh, it was interesting to see him get the opportunity to take the field, and it was more interesting to see the lack of opportunities he got after he got the start. Like, he thought it would be more of a of the rotation like we were seeing them do earlier in the year, but didn't appear like that. He just came on, got the start, then it looked like it was more of a Cobb and a Curtis for the majority of the game. Yeah, I'm. I still uh, don't fully understand or know what dictates the rotation. And that's something that I think Sean Cody actually asked uh, Brian Odom in the pregame show. Um, I wasn't on air at the time, so I didn't get the answer, but I will be sure to ask Sean to, to make sure we can disseminate that info. But it, it definitely is interesting just to see how, because I, I just didn't think that they would stray away from Mason and Tackett with, with what they've been doing lately. So anyway, interesting for sure. But overall, did the defense change anything besides what we just mentioned? Um like what and, and granted we knew coming into this game that the Notre Dame offense wasn't uh maybe the same type of powerful offenses that USC had been seeing prior to this but mm -hmm. did anything change when it comes to what uh the outcome that USC got from its defense in my opinion Notre Dame's uh, style of offense plays into the strengths of our defense our our front four they really try to uh be like a, a pound of football type team so with our front four being able to get off blocks and uh, get their hands on our ball carrier, <clears throat> that generated a lot of, if not negative plays, just short yards gains for the defense. So they were able to get a lot of uh, stops and force a lot of punts. So it uh, it was more um, it was more factor a bigger factor of their success in my opinion was the style of offense that they were playing i feel like they struggle more against like a spread explosive style offense where it's tackling in space they're going high tempo got a defense you know on the move a lot and you got to make a lot of adjustments and things like that i feel like those that type of offense is a uh, where they would they would struggle more against whereas Notre Dame style offense slower pace trying to smash smash mouth smash run it downhill at that not like an off tackle type team either they're going you know running behind the guards for the most part so it uh with us having a guy like bear up the middle it played into really the strengths of what i think our defense is so i'm not surprised that they had a lot of success versus uh notre dame notre dame's offense specifically is that going to be a one-off this season just looking at the rest of the re the regular season the type of offense that USC defense will face? Well, Utah will be pretty similar, especially because of their quarterback situation. So it's going to yeah. be more of a run heavy, maybe look for the tight ends, not really a four wide, sometimes five wide type looks where they're really trying to hit you vertically. They high tempo, they uh, really execute in a pass type game. So I feel like this is a good week. They'll get another opportunity to – play an offense that uh, their strengths are uh, goes against our defensive strengths. So it'll be a battle of will, and uh, hopefully we can come all, come out on top uh, in those matchups like we did against Notre Dame. We got a question from Sam who said, Dion, what happened on the long Tyree touchdown? It looked like cover zero with everyone in man except for Christian Roland Wallace, who just sits in a zone outside of the slot position. Was that the design? Was he supposed to be blitzing or was he meant to be in man on the slot wide receiver and Kalen playing deep in the middle? I believe that was uh, Jalen Smith uh, in the slot, covering the slot there. And I think it was just a misunderstanding of what leverage he should have had on the guy. Uh, according to who, if he had any help at all, he was kind of, he was not kind of, he was lined up on the outside of the slot, which would indicate that he has help in the middle. So that would indicate that there's some one playing the deep middle. So if there's a post or uh, any type of in breaking route, you know, he will have some help, some help with it. But that wasn't the case. As you saw, Kalen jumped the, the number three receiver. So, he was then at a disadvantage and chasing at that moment. So I'm not sure if that was 
like a disguise type thing and he just got caught out of position and ended up on the outside of the receiver and not playing him inside, which would signal that he really doesn't have any help, that it was his man, uh, regardless of what route he ran or what happened with the number one and number three receiver beside him. So I think that that was the the issue, and uh, the result of it was you know them hitting a, a deep post for for the explosive touchdown. Given what you previewed about Utah's offense, would it be fair to say that USC fans should have similar expectations for this defensive performance this upcoming week? Given that they were able to you know make make it happen against Notre Dame, I do. Although Utah's going to be a little different, their quarterback's a little more athletic. The quarterback that's been, that has been playing, Johnson, I believe, who will take the field against us, he's uh, got a lot more uh, athleticism, running ability to his game. So it'll be interesting how that factors into defending, you know, a run-heavy type offense because it's going to be some quarterback-driven runs so where it's really 11-on-11. 11 11, so we really going to... People are just going to have to win the one-on-one type deal. So we'll see how that that little wrinkle uh, of the difference of the Notre Dame versus Utah. So I would I would say to expect a, a good performance from our defense because this isn't, you know, like an explosive offense. So obviously we want to, you know, look good against an offense like this on the defensive side. So I would say expect a good uh Good performance, but expect it to look differently because Notre Dame is a different – they're different at the quarterback position than Utah is. So it's going to be a lot more quarterback runs. So it could be, you know, more grimier type defending <laughs> the run situation, you know, or, you know, they could come out and try to swing it, throw it around a little bit more than they have in the previous. So we'll see. But I think that will be the biggest difference from what we see our defense facing with the – Utah offense compared to Notre Dame, but I would still expect them to be successful. Makes sense. All right, I want to jump into questions. Before we do, just want to give a thanks to Audi. What if there was a portal to the future? Enter the fully electric Audi Q4 e-tron with advanced touchscreen infotainment system. Audi, the future awaits. And take your health to the next level with Symbiotica. Their premium, easy-to-take supplements fuel your body with key vitamins and minerals to help you reach peak performance off and off the off and on the field elevate your health today by going to symbiotica.com and use code fight on for 15 percent off site wide i was so close dion to a full <laughs> like 100 percent ad read but no one of these days one of these episodes i will get it um <laughs> Let's go to a question from Steb, who said, since the first half of the Colorado game, at least one side of the ball has seemed unprepared. What needs to change in your opinion? I'm not sure anything needs to change. We just need uh, everything to, everything to, uh, to work out in our favor, really. I mean, guys just, it's not like they've been doing anything different. It just hasn't clicked together, so... Hopefully, when when the lights are brightest and uh, the most is at stake, that uh, everything is is clicking on all cylinders at the at the same time. So I don't think there's anything that needs to be done differently. Guys just gotta you know look themselves in the mirror and uh, understand it's a sixty minute game. You know, gotta come out swinging and you gotta finish swinging. So as long as everybody's taking that type of approach, I feel like we'll come out hot on both ends both sides of the ball and uh, hopefully be able to finish strong on both sides of the ball moving forward. Ron said, would you say the silver lining is that the defense is playing good and that they look good the last three quarters last week and is holding and held uh, Notre Dame to 20 points this week? If you don't count the one yard score after a pick, he said. I don't believe in like silver linings. I mean, it's all about winning and the, I rather take, you know, uh, defense giving up 40 and Caleb putting up 50 if we're able to get the W. So sure. it's great that they were able to, like I said, make an offense that wasn't explosive. I mean, they were only averaging like 18, 20 points a game. So I'm glad that that, you know, is, is how it really shook out, you know. So they made them, you know, look exactly how they've been looking against all other opponents. So that was good to see. They didn't, like, go off or do nothing crazy against our defense. So it's definitely it could be a confidence builder or just more of a reassurance for themselves. You know, seeing positive tape, being successful, winning a one-on-one matchups, 
seeing themselves making tackles, you know, it, it makes a difference when you see you see yourself, you know, making progress, doing things that you're working on, doing it better than you were the week previously. So hopefully that that's what the defense takes away from their performance and uh, that confidence. It uh, just bleeds over into to the next week and uh, they're able to to bring that same energy to the field and hopefully you know the offense is on their a game as well and then we could see like what type of team complete team we really have we got a question from texas to southern california who said it looks as if caleb uh caleb's game isn't the same as last year he's more of a pocket passer now which takes away his dual threat capabilities are my observations correct or am i missing something and the only thing i'll jump in to add is that um Caleb did say that a focus this year has been to rely less on his legs than he did mm -hmm. in 2021. But that's that's my only input. You you take it away, Dion. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. You can tell that he's emphasizing more trying to keep his eyes downfield and try to make, make a play with his arm, you know, trying to prepare himself for the next level where you're not going to be able to just outrun everybody. Like, he doesn't want to still continue, you know, putting himself at risk, truly is what I think it is, you know. The more he runs, the more hits he, he takes because uh, he ran more than he needed to. You know, it wasn't like he is he's dropping back and it's just the C parts and he refuses to run. You know, it's not that type mm. of deal. It's like really trying to go through his progressions and let the, let the guys win their one-on-ones and get open rather than, you know, maybe going one read, maybe going to the second one, then putting it on his legs, taking it in his own hands and just taking off. So I think that's what you're seeing rather than them calling less like quarterback runs and things like that. We never really did that with Caleb. He just took off a lot faster this year, I think so, like, or when he was really – in that moment where he got the scrambling around, he was uh, – once he decided to run, he never – reconsider it to try and look for a pass he really was just taking off and he's he's doing that a lot less this year we got a question from socal manny who said have teams figured out how to stop our offense or is caleb williams in a slump and something i'm just going to add on to his question are we seeing a difference in this offense in year two now that uh teams have tape of what this caleb williams lincoln riley offense looks like I think people are just trying a lot of things. And, uh, you know, people got to remember this was the first game, if I'm not mistaken, that we didn't score like almost 50. So, yes. Maybe have to pump the brakes on it. People have learned how to stop the offense because they're still scoring a, a ton of points. Just this performance, I mean, it's, it's tough to put up a lot of points when you have three turnovers. Were, they had more than three turnovers, three interceptions and then two yeah. fumbles, if I'm not mistaken. So Yeah, five turnovers total. It was really just, you know, everything that could go wrong did go wrong type scenario, and they still were able to get, what, like 20 points. So I don't think people have learned how to stop us. It's, it's, it's a different offense. Yeah, we still have Caleb, but it's a different front five. It's different out on the edge without having Jordan Addison, and, and we don't got Die. Die was a really an eraser. Like he was a he's a really a good all around back, especially at the college level. So, I think you're just seeing you know Riley trying to figure out how to, you know, just uh, put people in the best position to be successful, and uh, they're still figuring it out while still trying to gel up front, get the right five guys uh, out there, and. Uh, Guys are they're seeing they were seeing a lot of the the three man rush and then out of nowhere they they had a lot of big guys coming at them a lot of five man pressure six man pressure the whole entire game like Notre Dame never uh um went away from that game plan they really we're gonna heat Caleb up they did it from the beginning all the way to the end so I just think it was more of a shocking experience for the offense they had never they hadn't played against that type of scheme really nobody has besides utah nobody has really tried to, uh, to approach playing coach riley's offense like that so more of a just a learning experience type game in my opinion i don't think people have really figured them out so to speak i also think like that question doesn't take into account the fact that like it's not copy and paste of 2021 like something we it's knew not. coming Something we knew coming into this season was that this offensive line just does not have the chemistry or the reps together that last year's offensive line did. There's no way you can replicate that given that 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 I think they had like around a hundred starts together as as a, yeah. as 
at least four of them did. So it's like it, yeah. we knew that the offensive line was going to be a quote unquote weakness of this team solely because one in the Clay Hilton era, offensive line recruiting just struggled under him as head coach, but also because you lost a lot of experience on, on the offensive line. So to your point, Dion, um, right. it's just it's just a different iteration of, of this offense that we saw from last season. And so I think this was the first time that we actually saw this offensive line. Uh, it, we, we saw them get tested and, and that quote-unquote lack of experience together get tested as well. So, of course... Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's much more communication and whatnot that comes when you are getting five or six more guys coming at you, right, Dion? Direct, correct, correct. And it involves more people. Is is more so than just the O line being on the same page. The back gotta be on the same page if he's involved in the protection. Caleb has to be on the same page. He has to understand where he's protected to how know how to maneuver the pocket and put himself, give himself uh, as much time as possible to to get the ball off or you know make a great decision. So all that it's a lot of people that are involved in that and when it's happening so fast and it's a lot of new guys truthfully i mean it's only what there was a six game together yeah and uh especially up front it's a lot of new guys and it's just it's tough you know they were playing against uh like i said nfl type bodies so you you're seeing a different picture and uh you're going the the talent level that you're going against took a step up, you know, even though Notre Dame had already lost two games, just just like uh just a blue bud team that 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 feeling of playing against somebody that's applying pressure and you don't feel like you have an answer and it just I feel like that's what was a reflection of what the O line put on film on Saturday, but it's not like indicative to who they are. As a unit moving forward, I feel like it was just a shock moment, and now they they can form a game plan. They understand where they're weak and how they can be attacked, and form a game plan to you know build some armor around that weakness to make it a strength. Makes sense. We had a question from Alex who said, "How do athletes in college or pro recover from a loss? Which loss hurts more? I guess meaning at the pro level or the college level? College for sure. I mean." Pro losses, they they matter more only if it's affecting like playoffs or if you're in the playoffs. But I mean, in the pros, you could lose a game, and not me specifically, but maybe at the club that night, like get blown out, be at the club. Like you lose a game <laughs> in college football. I mean, every loss, it feels like the world's coming to an end because every game really matters that much more. Like national champ, you lose two games. I mean. People really don't think you have a shot, like, and that has nothing to do with the, the college football playoff uh, system, like, even especially in the BCS era. Like, you lose two games. I mean, that national cha- championship dream, it seemed out of, out of reach. So every game just meant so much more. And I feel like you, because it, it's hard to compare because in the NFL is really year to year. So you don't really know who's mm-hmm. going to be in the locker room from one year to the other, whereas, yeah, and college football now is is kind of like that with the transfer portal and whatnot. <laughs> but when I was yeah. in school, we knew, I mean, who was going to be in there for the next three to four, maybe five years, depending on the guy. So it was, you could really been, build that bond and create mm-hmm. a lot of memories and put that, you know, a lot of work in with, with, with your brothers over the years. So like it may, it would make it hurt so much more. Like when you knew how hard people are working or who deserve, you know, what, and it didn't it doesn't work out for the team or whoever individually you know hurts that much more i feel like in college whereas the pros at the end of the day you're still getting paid and uh you know you're living a dream lose or win so you <laughs> kinda, you're, you're looking at it differently no that makes a lot of sense uh we have a question from texas to southern california again who said are the players aware that nfl recruiters are always looking at sc or do they try not to think about it i would assume that players would always bring their a game knowing that they're being watched by a prospective employer you come to sc because you know you're being watched like it's not something you shy away from you put on that card on go you know that the nfl is looking at you looking at coming to practice they're watching all your games and uh so you come to SC, you're definitely expecting to be under the microscope at the next level, and uh, you really should just be relishing at the opportunity to put your talents on display in front of them. So I hope nobody's out there trying not to think about it. You know, like, gotta 
live in a moment and understood understand the magnitude of it you know all your opportunities yeah. so i hope everybody you know grasps the the magnitude of the opportunities they're being able they're being given putting on that cardinal and gold and taking the field on saturday that you know you put some good tape on good tape out there consistently with those colors on man you almost you know guaranteed a chance to change your family's life so i hope they they, they really aren't letting that the magnitude of the situation passing by our final question from the fans comes from Warren, and I, I saved it for last because I think it's one leads us looking forward, but also kind of the question that I think lingers among USC fans right now. Uh, he said, can USC regroup to play against Washington and Oregon and make it to the Pac-12 championship game? I feel like they, they can't be looking down the line like that. They just have to regroup and really attack this Utah game and uh, – try really to put a complete game together we haven't done that this year yet so you know once once you can put that on tape and uh just put that that energy in in the in your locker room where they you build in belief that you know they can be a complete team and play a full 60 minutes on in all three phases so i feel like that is all they should be worried about is attacking this utah game and everybody knows who's coming after utah so can't think about that and uh well honestly there's no way that they're looking past Utah based off of what happened last year. I feel like Fair. this game was circled and even there should be even a darker circle or multiple circles over this <laughs> game now. So I feel like yeah. this isn't this is the per that's why I I'm so glad that this is who we have before you know, opponents that could put us in a situation where we could be overlooking somebody like there's no overlooking Utah in the history the recent history we had with yeah. them so I, there's no way that the team isn't you know just uh, laser focused in on their on Utah their opponent this week and I feel like they really have an opportunity to to build a lot of confidence in themselves and uh, put some good tape on on display on Saturday and uh, get the train back on on the right track and uh, get the season ahead in the direction that they they uh they hope it can they wish they can go uh, go in from the beginning of the year in your opinion Dion you know as a player how do you walk that fine line between you know being laser focused and trying to play your best but also not pressing too hard or you know making up for the fact of x y and z like how do you balance that really you just gotta you know be a believer that those around you are going to to make that great play as well to where you don't feel like you got to make every great play, just the ones that are presented to you to make, you know? So I feel like there's just, it's especially for someone like Caleb who really not only has he had to make a lot of great plays for, for our team, but just his whole life, as far as I know, his football life, he's just been a great player and he's always made that great play. So like when it's, when it's not happening, that's where you could really like press to try and you know kind of feel like yourself again like you don't feel like yourself because you're not being great you know you're so used to being great so I feel like that's where the line has to teeter when your game's just off you really gotta believe you know that the foundation is there and you don't have to have an out of body experience to get back on track. You know, you don't got to do something crazy or you know yeah. make a make a, an amazing play. Just really got to just believe that uh you know those amazing plays are going to be made by the the teammates around you and uh once you get an opportunity to to make another amazing play, you know, not pressing for one, but it's it's presented to you. You just got to take advantage of it there and that's how you like, you know, get your confidence back and start to feel more like yourself. So I feel like that's, it's, it's more of a line to teeter when, when things are going your way. Hmm. All righty, Dion. Uh, unfortunate episode that we had to record today. Obviously you said at the start, the sky is not falling. Um, any final, th- any final thoughts about, you know, the state of USC football right now? Any, any thoughts for USC fans who are a little worried after Saturday's performance? It was a disappointing result. Uh, on Saturday, but I mean, truthfully, the goal is always to win the Pac-12 and then let the chips fall where they may after that. So the main goal is still attainable. So 
hopefully, you know, just uh, root the boys on. Hopefully they uh, are able to right the ship this uh, this week against Utah and uh, give us, you know, a lot to feel better about, <laughs> especially how these this matchup is going for us recently in the past. So uh, I'll say it's a, an excited game to be looking forward to after a disappointing result. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to follow up uh, with you guys uh, on this Sunday with another victory episode, another victory podcast instead of uh, what we're doing this week. So <laughs> <laughs> I say exactly. positive vibes and uh, everything that you, you know, hoping for for the season to, to end up and achieve is still attainable. A hundred percent. Way to wrap it up, Dion. You did my job for me there. <laughs> Alrighty, that's gonna wrap it up. Dion, thank you so much for another episode. Once again, congrats to your family. So excited you, that you guys you. are now a family of three. But that's gonna wrap it up. I'll be back with Cody Kessler to preview the Utah matchup that Dion and I have uh, talked about this episode. So stay tuned for that. But that's gonna wrap it up. That's Dion. I'm Keely. We'll see y'all next time.